I'm joined now by investment writer and publisher Jonathan Davis. He's just edited the Investment Trusts Handbook for 2020. He joins me now. Jonathan, thanks for being with us. Um, just reading the, 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 the book, I mean, it's got a lot in there looking at the industry, everything from very technical articles to some quite basic information on investment trusts. Who's it aimed at? It's aimed basically at uh, anyone who either knows about investment trusts uh, and invests in them or anyone who actually wants to learn about investment trusts and invest in them. And by that, I mean both uh, professionals and increasingly the number of what we uh, call self-directed investors who, uh, who are discovering investment trusts as an alternative to the traditional unit trust open, open-ended open fund. So this is very much a book aimed at the end investor rather than an industry professional? Uh, it's more the latter than the former, but there are some uh, investment professionals who I know do read it and uh, find it quite useful. In particular, in the IFA market, we found there's quite a, an interesting audience because, as you as you all know, investment trusts are making a big effort to market themselves these days to IFAs as well as to uh, uh, other types of investor. So there is a professional market, but yes, mainly the self-directed investor, the uh, the, the the investor who invests through a platform has a you know a decent amount of uh, assets to invest and is as interested in finding out for himself a little bit more about what he should be doing with his money. So it's a mixture of educational. Uh, and as you say, professional technical material. Yeah. Now you've been editing this investment trust handbook for a number of years. What's new in this edition? Okay, so every year we publish this thing. And the, the original idea I had was it would be something like uh, a wisdom for the investment trust business. In other words, a mixture of a uh, of sort of journal of record on the one hand uh, and highlighting what's going to happen next year, what's been going on, and so forth. So it's a mixture of that. So every year we kind of introduce most of the content. Ninety percent this year of the content is new or in the educational material that I've put together at the back of the book, for example, uh, I update that every year with new figures and add some new charts and illustrations and so on. Uh, but there are a number of themes this year. Uh, obviously, the Woodford Fund scandal has had an impact on the investment trust market and the fund market generally. That's in there. Uh, issues about uh, how investment trusts are run, how they're managed, how they're sold, and so on. And also some interviews with people talking about the actual investment um, markets themselves what could happen in the next year, what they've been uh, doing, technology, Far East, that kind of thing. Well, you mentioned the the, the Woodford uh, situation. Um, obviously, what got his, the highlights originally was his open-ended fund getting in, into trouble. But I mean, it's not as if the investment trust has come out um, in a completely pristine state either. What are some of the challenges that's thrown up for closed-end funds? Okay. So, as you say, the Woodford fund was an open-ended fund, which meant it had daily dealing. You could redeem your your units uh, any any time of the day, any day rather, rather than uh, uh, being tied in. Uh, but they was also trying to invest in a lot of illiquid uh, assets, uh, startup companies and so on, which weren't easy to sell. And that's how he got into trouble. Uh, at the same time, he has been running this investment trust, uh, which is a much, much better vehicle for investing this way. Uh, and the Woodford Patient Capital Trust, as it was originally called, okay, was set up to do just that. And it was a perfect vehicle. So the collapse of his open-ended fund uh, should not have had any negative implications for the investment trust because it operates in an entirely different way. However, having said that, uh, it's clear that some of the way in which the investment trust was set up was not ideal. So most of the board of directors were people who had a business association with Neil Woodford and therefore had a clear conflict of interest when the troubles uh, started to arise. So that's been a big lesson, I think, that, that has come out of this. It's corporate governance again which is traditionally one of the investment trust's great strengths. Uh, but in this case, it has demonstrated one or two of the flaws in that. But more generally, I think the Woodford Fund scandal has been good for the investment trust sector, precisely because it could the kind of thing that happened to that open-ended fund could not happen in an investment trust. Well, he was looking at sort of, uh, sort of early stage companies. It was a little bit off the, the, the beaten track, if I can put it like that, from developed equity markets. But one of your writers or contributors, Max King, is saying now that 48% of the investment trust universe is in alternative investments. As you look at it, is there a chance that perhaps some of these practices that you saw in the Woodford case might be taking place in some of the new fund types that are coming out and which a lot of uh, investors are putting their money into in, in the investment trust space. Yes, I don't think it's a big problem. I mean, it's fair to say, as you said, that alternative assets now account for about half the assets mm -hmm. that the investment trust manage, uh, sector manages. But the total pool of money that investment trusts now manage is has doubled in the last 10 years. So it's 50% of a much larger pool. 
So it's not a term of it's not a case of the alternative assets driving out money from the traditional uh, equity funds. Um, but yes, of course, the, it's a new kind of a lot of these uh, investment trusts invest in things like renewables, in infrastructure, some of the debt, uh, some some debt um, uh, alternative asset uh, trusts. They all raise new issues. They're, they're much harder to analyze. You have to take more on trust from the managers about what the current net asset value of the trusts are. And I think it's taken a little bit of time for people to get used to that, for investors to get used to that. And they do require a lot more careful analysis and study. But I think in general, it's a very, it's a very positive thing for the investment trust sector because it's introducing uh, a broader kind of asset uh, choice for the end user. And if you are a traditional, um, you know, shall we say, retail investor, you haven't had a chance to invest in some of these things before. And here you've got a chance to do so if the board is independent and properly qualified and so on. Uh, it's a very good structure. So I think actually on the whole, it's a good thing. One of the themes in the book this year that I picked up on, indeed you've got a whole article in there by, a, I think, a, a chairman of Investment Trust, is marketing and the importance of talking to the end consumer, I think. Something 20 yes. years ago, you wouldn't have expected boards to get involved in. Uh, what, are the, what are the challenges that throws up for the industry? And what, what are the opportunities if you're an, an investor or a potential investor in Investment Trust? Okay, so Investment Trust... Used to be known as the best kept city, secret in the city, mm. because on the whole they were the uh, the sole preserve of people who either worked in the city or some of the big institutions like insurance companies and so on. But that has changed in the last twenty years. That's completely changed. In fact, a lot of the old institutional investors have left, and increasingly it is private investors who are involved in uh, in in making up the market for these things. And of course, the investment trusts are companies, and there are. Uh, obviously, a lot of restrictions in company law on what you can do in terms of advertising and marketing, particularly when it comes to marketing your own shares. Mm. Okay, that's a big constraint that investment trusts have always suffered from. However, uh, a number of things have changed. The regulations have become a bit easier. And increasingly, we're finding that investment trusts are taking marketing more seriously. They are, for example, I mean, it was very rare that if you were a, a retail investor, apart from the annual report and the interim report that you got, it was quite rare to actually find out any more information about them. But now there are more brokers offering that material in a format that retail investors can access. Uh, investment trusts are advertising in uh, some of the trade press, in some of the uh, uh, money publications, uh, and they're gradually taking it a lot more seriously. Of course, that costs money, and that money is eventually is ultimately paid for by the shareholder. So it has to be done within a kind of modest, uh, uh, within that constraint. But of course, that's always been true of open-ended funds as well. Who pays for the marketing in the end? It's the, it is actually the investor who pays for it. Well, another thing investors are paying for <laughs> is the uh, is the board. And again, a theme yes. running through the book uh, is a lot of changes happening to boards of investment trust, not least on issues such as diversity. Um, how big an issue is that now compared to where it was three, four, five years ago? How big do you think it's going to be in the future? I think it's a very big issue at the moment. And indeed, it's one of the things about investment trust that is one of their greatest strengths in theory. In theory, the fact that you have a board of directors who have a all the responsibilities under company under the company law that you have in any other listed company, uh, they have obligations and duties, and they are accountable to you and can be thrown out by you at an AGM. In theory, that is a much better structure, and indeed, it is in practice really works out that way for most investment trusts. However, there have been examples in the past where that was corporate governance was pretty poor, uh, and I don't think we would have had the split capital scandal, for example, 20 years ago, if boards had been more independent than they are now. But what's happening is we're seeing an increasing number of uh, people who haven't worked in the city or worked in the finance business coming in into boards. A lot more women are coming in and there's a concentrated drive to create more diversity on boards. Still a lot to be done on that score. Uh, and I think it is, it's very hard to prove, of course, in the short term, it makes a difference or not. But I do think that the the, uh, the professionalization of the investment trust board is going to be a really strong selling point uh, in the future. Not least because with Woodford, for example, when the open-ended fund was, was effectively uh, shut down by the uh, what they call the authorized corporate director. I mean, you don't know who, who, who the authorized corporate director is. You can't. You can find out some names, but they're not people you can who are accountable to you. It's a very big positive for the investment trust sector. And as long as it keeps on going in this professionalization way, I think it's going to become increasingly a positive selling point. Well, one thing you do have in the book is a number of articles from very well-known high-profile managers, um, people like Bruce Stout of Murray International, Ben Rogoff on Polar Technology, yes. um, Simon Edelston on um, one of the trusts that Artemis run. But some might say, well, these guys are 
out and about quite a lot. What is it they're able to tell you in a chapter or book format right. that you don't get from the annual report and accounts or fact sheets or little update videos? Okay. Well, what I think you get, um, and this is a, my personal view and my own personal experience, I mean, I've been doing these kind of uh, what I call extended Q&As with um, uh, fund managers in particular for a number of years. And what I find is you do get an insight, a more coherent insight into their into their personality, their um, their own back history, uh, and their strategy than you do by, if I may say so, listening to a ten minute video, uh, where everybody is very polished and they they come across, they know exactly what the lines are going to say, and so on. Um, I think I've always found them very useful. I've found that a lot of professionals find them very useful because it does get behind the headline and the marketing, if in a certain sense. Um, I think I've been around long enough that I, I think I can, you know, spot a, a line in uh, uh, in BS better than most people, if I can use that term. Uh, and there's a lot of that about. Mm -hmm. um, so I think you get behind a bit. I mean, there's a, quite a lot, for example, about Ben Rogoff, the the uh, fund manager at uh, Polar Capital Technology, which tells you about his early history as a as a as a young man, how he got interested in computers, why he's kind of still obsessed with that thing to the extent of he collects uh, them, doesn't he? I think from memory, he does. He has them. He has a collection of. Sinclairs and other old machines like that that probably yeah. most of your viewers will, will never, <laughs> won't have heard of. But these are early stage, the first early stage computers. And he has a collection of them on his walls at home. He has a very understanding wife, I think. But uh, that's what he it sounds it, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that gives you a flavor of the guy. I mean, I've known, again, I've known people I interview, I tend to have known for a long time. And I'm aware of things about them that perhaps don't come across in their public uh, performances, if you like, because mm. they're quite strictly regimented. So I've always found them very useful. Um, I was given some very good advice years ago by uh, uh, Charlie Ellis, a well-known American consultant. You know, he said that basically the most important thing when you're choosing an active fund manager in particular is not about the performance, it's not about the skill, not even about the hard work. It's about the integrity of the guy. Mm. Are the, is this man or woman, as increasingly it is, are they going out every day saying, I really want to do the best for my investors? Or are they actually saying, I want to do the best for myself? Mm. Or my firm. I think that's a very important insight. And uh, the more you understand about the individual, the more important that becomes. A final question. You said right at the start that the Investment Trust Handbook, you, you conceive it a little bit like a wisdom for investment yes. trusts. Wisdom always has a cricketer of the year. So if you could pick <laughs> your Investment Trust Person of the Year for 2020, who would that be and why? Gosh, that is a very interesting question. I'm very pleased that we're getting people like Terry Smith bringing investment trusts uh, bring it starting an investment trust. Okay, it's a spin off from his main Fundsmith Equity Fund, which has done extraordinarily well and become exceptionally big. Um, but I think he's a fabulous investor, whether you like him as a personality or not. And he's a little marmite in that respect, I think. Um, but he did come to the market and he did raise uh, a significant amount of money, some, you know, several hundred million uh, for an investment trust structure, which is run by two of his uh, acolytes uh, and invest in slightly smaller cap companies than the one he. Does in his main fund. I think that's a terrific addition to the the, the the breadth and range of investment trusts out there. And I should say, I'm not uncritical of the investment trust industry. I'm not here to you know to promote them. I'm actually just a fan of them. And I think I want very much for them to get better, to get bigger, more diverse, and to perform better. Um, but I think things like Terry Smith coming to the market are very, very positive. Jonathan Davis, thank you very much for coming in and talking to okay. us about Investment Trust Handbook 2020. And that is available to purchase. It's published by Harriman House. It's also available on Amazon. From all of us here at the Asset TV Book Club, thank you for watching and goodbye for now.